Scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 20 through 25. Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 20 through 25. Chronological Bible. If you're using one of the old ones, it's page 822. If you're using one of the new ones, it's page 779. Again, new one, 822. Old one, 822. New one, 779. Isaiah, chapter 5, verses 20 through 25. The word of the Lord says this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. Therefore, As tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Yet for all of this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, your steadfast love for us never ceases. Your mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, God. Father, as we meet here today, I pray that your spirit would dwell among us, that your spirit would dwell within us, and that you would enlighten us to the truths of your word through your spirit. God, I pray that our presence would decrease, that your presence would increase, and even though we're not meeting inside of a building, that this meeting area would become holy ground today. God, I know within our individual lives and families, there's a lot of sickness. There's a lot of disease. Today is a day of heartbreak for many. There's just a lot of stuff that's keeping us from you. And even if there's not a lot of stuff, it is a holiday weekend where many will be celebrating and partying. God, be present. Speak to us and minister to us in the place that we need to hear from you today for the glory of your kingdom. God, may we worship you from our hearts and not from our heads as we enter this time together. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. At this point, children are now dismissed to go to children's church. It's funny, I had a moment as my wife was giving announcements earlier. You ever see, maybe you are this couple or you you run into this couple every once in a while and you go, man, do they ever talk to one another? Because they don't seem to be on the same page at all. And then I realized as my wife was giving announcements that apparently we are that couple. Because as she was giving the announcement that I handed to her right before announcements without explaining it to her at all, um, the event that she's talking about on August 8th is really not even remotely PRC related. It's just an area, there's a group of us pastors who got together and said it'd be really neat to do a joint service. And so what we're doing is a joint service on Sunday night, August 8th together, where PRC is having a five-minute slot where they can talk about their ministry and what they're doing in the community. Uh, Most of you know Matt McDermott. Matt McDermott's going to be sharing that night. He speaks for me on occasion when I'm not able to come here. Look, there's going to be coffee from Avenue 209. There's going to be ice cream um, from Oddfellas. So it's just going to be a good night to come together as churches and celebrate together. And that's really what that night is all about. So I would encourage you, to, if you've got nothing else to do on August 8th in the evening, to come out to that. It's going to be down um, in town, but it's going to be a great night. So with that being said, let's all get on the same page together. How's that sound? Speaking out of the book of Isaiah today, that's the scripture reading. But if you're reading through the chronological Bible, there's, guys, I, I'm re- I hope you're really enjoying this. Um, now's when we get to the tough part. We're basically halfway there. Like the yellow, in my, the yellow in my Bible is where I'm at. So if you look at it, I mean, you're basically halfway there, right? 
And if you're keeping up with your reading so far, wonderful. And if you're not, don't get down, don't get distraught, don't give up. Keep plugging away. If you're three months behind, just stay three months behind and read that extra one day at a time. Okay? Don't feel like you have to get up. But what we're reading through now is there's a lot of good stuff going on. Okay? I'm going to talk, start by talking actually out of the book of Jonah. Right? And, and the reason I, I bring that up is because maybe it seems kind of random, but in our reading this week, the reading from Jonah chapter 3 and the reading from Isaiah chapter 5 are almost right beside each other. Not quite, but only a day apart. And most of you know the story of Jonah. You learned it on the flannel graph as a kid in, L in, in Sunday school, right? If you remember the flannel graph, the little sticky things. That was outstanding, right? Jonah chapter 3. We know Jonah chapter 1, right? God gives Jonah commands. Jonah runs away, goes in the opposite direction, gets on a boat, tries to sail away. Storm comes up, can't do anything about it. So what's Jonah do? He jumps in the water, gets swallowed by a whale, spit on the beach three days later. That's Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 2 is a prayer, and then we get to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3 is an important chapter because it's a chapter where God, Jonah actually decides to follow through on God's calling when given a second chance to do so. Right? He says, yeah, I'm going to do the thing you told me to do in the first place. I'm going to go to Nineveh, and I'm going to preach the word that you say. And so here's what Jonah preaches in Nineveh. He says this, scripture, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. That's pretty much it. At God's call, he preaches those words. And what was the response of the Ninevites? The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. That's what we know out of Jonah chapter 3. That's what Scripture tells us. These Ninevites recognized the importance of Jonah's calling, of this prophetical calling upon their lives, and the implications that it had in their lives. God wasn't pleased with them. God was very upset with where they were at. And if they didn't change course, it was going to end pretty disastrously for them. So the response was almost miraculous because it was instantaneous. Where they said, look, we've got to humble ourselves before God. We've got to put on sackcloth. We've got to not just do it with our hearts, but show it physically that we're going to bow before God and give him control. And we're not going to get into Jonah's response to that at all. But can you imagine if somebody in our world or a group of people in our world had that response today? I mean, it, it seems almost unheard of, doesn't it? Our world is full of the exact opposite. Our world is full of loud, boisterous voices. And maybe you're thinking, right now, that's you, Pastor Scott, and that could be the case, right? But our, our world is full of voices screaming and clamoring for our attention, telling you that their way is the right way, and you have to do it this way, and my way is the only way, and the other person is wrong all the time. I mean, when was the last time, think about it this way. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. None of us do. I get that. But when was the last time that you heard a politician admit that they were wrong? I know I pick on politicians all the time, right? I get it. It's low fruit. But I, re I was reading an article this week um, from, from an online news digest called The Week. And the writer wrote this in 2015, and he said this. He said, can a politician ever truly admit an error? These days it seems like you're more likely to win the lottery or see lightning strike twice in the same place. And in the middle of a heated campaign, you might as well ask to see unicorns romping through Washington, D.C. Right? It just doesn't happen. Because nobody likes to admit wrongdoing on their part. I know that I don't. Right? But how long are we willing to hold on to our misleadings? How long are we willing to hold on to the faults in our lives, the inaccurate statements, in an attempt to simply save our pride? I ask because the Ninevites weren't. When they were confronted by the prophetic words of Jonah, they weren't. They assumed a posture of vulnerability and repented before God. How about us? How about you and I? Are we willing to do the same? Because let's be honest, if we're, if we're open before God and there is wrongdoing in our lives, then we should assume that position as well. And I believe the story of Jonah and the Ninevites leads us perfectly into our passage today. Because that's where we find ourselves. That's the context of Isaiah chapter 5. God is not only disappointed, he is righteously ticked. 
he is upset, and he is angry because of ch his chosen people, the ones who should know his commands, the ones who should be following his teachings, the ones who he brought out of Egypt through the desert, the whole thing that we've read up to this point, have basically said, no, nah, we got other things that are doing good for us, God. God says, don't intermarry with those people because they will turn your hearts away from God. They will turn your hearts away from me. What do they do? They intermarry. What happens? Their hearts are turned away from God. They start worshiping these foreign gods. And so this passage we come to in Isaiah chapter 5 is a warning to these people. We know how this passage starts. Woe to those. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who call sweet bitter and bitter sweet. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are hearers at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks. Woe to those who will quit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. So I want to be perfectly clear as we start today that when we hear the words, woe to you or woe to those, that is a side that you never want to be on ever. You can find this phrase in almost every prophetic book in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, from Isaiah all the way to Malachi. It pops up in almost every book. It pops up because God is frustrated and exacerbated with the behavior of his chosen people. And it's not just in the Old Testament. If you turn all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, you will see it multiple times in there as well. For those who are in opposition to God when it comes to the end of times. Or you can even look in the Gospels and find it when Jesus is addressing the Pharisees shortly before his crucifixion. Shortly before these people that he is saying, woe to you, have him beaten and crucified and killed. You see, when a prophet says, woe to you, and you fall into the subset of that group that the prophet is talking about, you better pay attention. I'll quickly verbally introduce you to a friend of mine from high school. His name is Kevin McCarty. Kevin McCarty was a year older than me. Kevin McCarty was a good friend, just the kind of friend you like to have. He was a big guy. We played football and volleyball together. He was a very good football player, stood about six foot five inches tall, 285 pounds, the kind of guy that you like to be on your side, right? But he also liked to joke around. He had a heart like a little kid. I would go over, to, I started my junior year, he was his senior year, my junior year, going over to Kevin McCarty's house once a week because this new television show came out that we were talking about that we both realized that we loved to watch. You know what this new show was at the time? Home Improvement. Maybe you've heard of it. So every Tuesday night, I believe it was, I went over to Kevin McCarty's house about a half hour before Home Improvement started, and we watched Home Improvement together. And I learned things from Kevin that I didn't even know were possible. Like, I went over, and, and, and like his mom would make a crock pot of mac and cheese. And he had a paper plate, and he would fill the whole plate with mac and cheese. Like, because the paper plates have a lip on them where you can actually soup it up a little bit in there. I didn't know you were allowed to do that. Like, I never seen anybody do that, along with the three, you know, barbecue sandwiches. And then, on top of that, to go back for seconds. And, and every time we'd start watching the show, we'd eat not one Freezy Pop, we would start with two Freezy Pops and usually end about five or six. See, this was not what happened at the Garmin residence. It was, you got a Freezy Pop and you're done. My kids would have been very sad by that. Well, I got to get back on track here, right? So, that year, in the winter, following a home basketball game, at one of our home games, a bunch of group of people out in the hallway talking. Kevin's standing here. Again, Kevin's a big guy, strong guy. Went to Villanova on his football scholarship, right? One double-A player. And he heard me say something that he misinterpreted. Right? I, we weren't even talking to the same people, but he thought I was addressing him, and he thought it was an offensive comment. And like a flash, before I knew it, he had grabbed me, turned me, and pinned me up against the wall with his hands. My feet were literally not touching the ground. And I couldn't move. And I, my eyes, and you could tell by everybody's reaction, were, were just huge. He said, what would you say? And I told him what I said. He goes, oh, okay, my bad. And he dropped me, turned around, and resumed his conversation as though nothing had ever happened. Right? He's laughing, he's talking, he's doing his thing. And I was shocked. Like, I, I, I can still remember it. I was just shocked. Like, what just happened? 
Because when he had me pinned up against that wall, he had all of my attention. I was completely immobilized, and I realized how truly strong, even though we've been playing football together for a couple years, how truly strong and dominant this guy actually was compared to me. When you hear the words, woe to you, that should grab your attention in a similar manner. That's what should make you sit up and go, okay, what is going on here? What do I have to look at? What do I have to pay attention to? It should stop your mind and cause you to focus intently on the scripture that is in front of you. To realize that what's written next may have significant and eternal impact on your life. So why the woes today? God was frustrated with his children. I told you about that. They had turned their backs on him. They were trying to do life on their own instead of doing life with him. And another parallel scripture that's in our reading this week is actually from the prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verse 4. He says, their love is like a morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. This is how God felt about the children of Israel, about his chosen people and their love for him. They forget about me. They don't care about me. They go on about their daily lives. But then Hosea goes on to say what? Because of this, I will cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. My judgments flashed like lightning upon you. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. They had turned their backs on God and they were not following God. And even when they were, they were only doing it out of sense of obligation and with their head and not from their heart. It was, oh great, here we have to go again. You know, First day of school is awesome, isn't it? The kids are excited. The parents are excited. Everybody's happy to go. How about come February? Right? It's a different story. Get up. Let's go. Get out the door. You're going to be late. I don't want you home anymore. You need to go. We may not be saying it out loud, but there's those thoughts running through our minds. Right? That's where they were at. They were doing it out of a sense of obligation. They were not doing this sacrifice thing out of love or faithfulness to God. They were not sacrificing him because of that. They were going through the motions. They didn't care about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How do we know? Because they set up shrines. They set up altars to other gods on the very gland that their God had given them. They worshipped Baal. They worshipped Ashtoreth. And it was this cycle of kings that kept defending it. And this sinful thinking had pervaded their minds and pervaded their lives and corrupted their hearts before God. And God was fed up with it. Now, I didn't tell you all that to give you a history lesson on the nation of Israel today. I tell you that to give you a history lesson, very brief, on the nation of Israel today because it is incredibly relevant and necessary for us to hear as well. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who put darkness for light. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Woe to those who are hearers at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks. Woe to those who deny justice to the innocent. And what's the result of the woes in our passage? Verse 25 says, Therefore the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Yet for all of this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. Now guys, when I read through that, you get an idea in your mind of something. Hear me state unequivocally that I like preaching about God's love. I like preaching about God's forgiveness. I like speaking about his faithfulness in my life. Even during the times where I may not see it, I know he has been faithful to me in the past, and he will remain faithful to me in the future. And although I can't ever, I imagine, and certainly not that state presently, fully encompass or process Christ's sacrifice and coming to earth and living an earthly life and then his crucifixion and death and resurrection. I love his care, concern, and his heart for those in his ministry, for those living in sin that he encountered. Because I believe that's his care, concern, and heart for me as well. So I love speaking about that stuff. I don't necessarily like speaking about the Lord's anger burning against his people. He's striking them down. But we cannot ignore what Isaiah is saying to us today, right? This passage should cause us to squirm with some discomfort especially if this passage is related to where we're at. 
Here's what I mean. I am going to read to you some current statistics from a Pew Research poll that was put out this year. 2021 research poll by Pew that, it, that covers trends among Christian people or those who call themselves Christians. Here's some of the statistics. Again, these are people who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. 76% of Christians believe in absolute certainty that there is a God. That means that one quarter of all people who call themselves Christ followers do not have absolute certainty that there is a God. How about this one? When asked about the importance of faith in their life, only 68% said that their faith was very important to them. The remainder wavered between somewhat important and not very important at all. Guys, Jesus said these words. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Because whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And yet only 68% of Christians say that their faith is very important to them. If Jesus didn't miss, mince words, why do we? How about this one? 47% of Christians attend religious service on a weekly basis. Less than half. Only 68% of Christians pray daily. Two-thirds. 43% get their sense of right and wrong from their faith. If you break that down for, f further... 8% of professing Christians get their sense of right and wrong from philosophy and reason, 41 from their common sense, 6% from science, and 2% just don't even know. Comes from somewhere. Only 38% of Christians believe that there are absolute standards between right and wrong. 59% of Christians believe that right and wrong is situationally dependent. 45% of Christians read their Bible once a week. 25% of Christians believe that the Bible is not the word of God or don't know where it came from. One quarter of Christians do not believe that this is the word of God or know where it came from. 85% of Christians, you've heard me quote similar statistics before, believe in heaven while only 70% believe in hell. 54% of Christians believe that homosexuality should be accepted while 38% believe it should be discouraged. 52% of Christians strongly favor or don't know about homosexual marriages among Christians. Majority of Christians favor or don't know homosexual marriages. 21% believes that humans evolved over time due to natural processes. 29% believe in evolution according to God's design. And 42% believe that humans have always existed in our current state. Now that's a lot of statistics. I get it. I wonder what those statistics would have looked like 50 years ago. I'm guessing a little, if not a lot, different than they do today. I mean, we'll never know, right? But even in just the last two years alone, two years, ten years alone, but even two years, the statistics about sexuality and homosexuality have changed dramatically. I mean, think about it. How many churches, how many denominations have split in the last couple of decades alone over this topic? Almost every denomination has been affected by this. Because if the denomination hasn't split, you more than likely have lost at least a couple of churches, or you have definitely lost some attenders or parishioners of churches over this very topic. Sexuality is a huge issue that is rapidly changing in our society. It's permeated the walls of the church as well. And oftentimes when we talk about sexuality or homosexuality, we go to Romans chapter 1. What does Romans chapter 1, verse, starting in verse 21, say? I'm going to read to you a bunch here, but there's a reason for it. It says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified God, glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their hearts, their foolish hearts were darkened. Check out the next line. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Sound familiar, maybe? And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds of the air and, and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts. 
to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised all men. Boy, that sounds awful familiar to what we're reading through today. Goes on to say, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves a the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Remember that one, children. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. <laughs> Doesn't that sound like it was written today to us as the church in America? So why are we so afraid as a church to call sin, sin anymore? Why are we afraid of being labeled as intolerant or abusive? Because guess what? I got news for you. If you're a Christian, the church is already being labeled as intolerant. If the church of Jesus Christ lives up to the standards set in Romans chapter 1, then those within our society will label us as intolerant. You'll also be labeled as hateful, Ignorant, unloving, just to name a few. And not just society will label you that way, but other Christians will label you that way as well. You see, it's my personal belief, and take it for what it's worth, because I don't know it to be true. But if we continue on the current path that we're on as a nation, that the church will probably, probably be labeled as a hate group during my lifetime. Why do I say this? Because I read articles. I study. Right? Here's an excerpt from an article I saw this week dated March 15th, 2014, so seven years ago. It's on thehumanist.com. And maybe you're thinking, humanism? What is humanism? It's not like the human fund from the Seinfeld episode years ago or anything like that. It'd be kind of cool if it was, right? Here's, here's a definition of humanism taken directly from their website. A rational philosophy without theism. So there is no God other than supernatural beliefs that is informed by science, guided by reason, inspired by art, and motivated by compassion to commentary on politics, science, technology, art, and culture. Here's what they write. A hate group is one that holds beliefs or practices that attack or malign an entire class of people, typically for their immutable characteristics. Currently, there are eight, 939 hate groups operating in the United States, many of which are religiously driven. Now, understand that the hate groups that they list in this article are hate groups that you and I would go, yep, definitely, without a doubt, these people are messed up, and they should be labeled as a hate group. So I'm not going to say that, right, because it just is what it is. What I'm going to do is read to you a little bit further. Towards the end of the article, the, the author writes this. Although there are many religions... Um, religious Americans who are good at heart and genuinely believe and exemplify love and acceptance, there is no denying that fanatical religious belief can be a breeding ground for hate, violence, and bigotry. So how do we define that? She doesn't say. She says, when the beliefs that define one's entire world are threatened, ideologues will often do all that is necessary to preserve it. It's unfortunate there are more groups in this category than I'm able to talk about here. Hate is a product of conditioning, upbringing, ignorance, and narrow-mindedness. The solution must be teaching tolerance and acceptance wherever we can. Now, why do I find that fascinating? Because there's a complete lack of definitions on who defines what. But I read another article this week from author and historian. His name is Tom Holland. He is an avowed atheist. And he wrote this. He said, while studying the ancient world, basically what we're reading through in our Bible even right now, he said, I realized the following. That simply the ancients were cruel and their values were utterly foreign to me. The Spartans routinely murdered imperfect children. The bodies of slaves were treated like outlets for the physical pleasure of those with power. Infanticide was common. The poor and the weak had no rights. So how do we get there from here? 
Avowed atheist, author, and historian Tom Holland says this. It was Christianity. Christianity revolutionized sex and marriage, demanding that men control themselves and prohibiting all forms of rape. Christianity confines sexuality within monogamy. And he writes, it's ironic that these are now the very standards for which it is derided. Christianity elevated women. In short, Christianity utterly transformed the world. The standards that were once looked upon as the salvation of humanity has now evolved, or maybe I should say devolved, into being a scourge in our society. You know what else I find very interesting? That as I read through Romans chapter 1, and those 10, 11 verses I just read to you, many of you are probably listening going, where's Pastor Scott going with that? And maybe you're sitting in your seats over the last five, ten minutes listening to me talk, being pretty uncomfortable. Because sexuality is a tough concept to talk about in our society. And that's not even where I'm heading with this message, a message in which I'm almost done. So don't get too caught up. All right? When I read through Romans chapter 1, most of you hear me read about sexuality and human sexuality. But you ignore the other sins that are listed there which are a third of that entire passage. We like to do that. It's easy, right? Well, I don't struggle with that, so preach against it, Pastor Scott. Go to town. Go get them. That's the comfortable stuff for me. That's the stuff I don't want to have to deal with, right? But what else? What else is listed? Because God followers didn't feel it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God in their lives. What did God give them over to? Being filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil, he said. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Are there sexual sins, including homosexuality in this passage? Absolutely. But is that all there is? Definitely not. I don't want you to focus on the sins of others and what they're doing wrong. I want you to focus on how God is speaking to you in your life through this passage today. It's not about condemning others. It's about opening yourself up to God and His Spirit being alive and at work within you. Even the ones that are brought up in our passage today, calling good evil and evil good, putting darkness for light and light for darkness, being wise in your own eyes. Boy, I struggle with that one. Heroes at drinking wine, champions at mixing drinks, denying justice to the innocent. And what is the prophet Isaiah will say will be the sentence of those who are guilty of that? Their roots will decay and their flowers will blow away like dust. The Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. Guys, even when Isaiah wrote this, he was not speaking to those who didn't follow God. He was speaking directly God's chosen people, just like this passage should be speaking to the church today. Don't look outside these walls of who this message applies to. Look inside of how God is speaking to you. Woe to you should grab your attention and open your eyes. should cause us to analyze our priorities and our methodologies in our lives. It must cause introspection not accusation or damnation outwards. C.S. Lewis said it well in his book, Mere Christianity. He writes this. He said, progress means getting nearer to the place where you want to be. If you have taken a wrong turn, then to go forward does not get you any nearer. Boy, how simple and smart is that, right? If you are on the wrong road, progress means doing an about turn, walking back to the right road, and in that case, the man who turns back the soonest is the most progressive man. Guys, faith in Jesus Christ is not just about taking action. Faith in Jesus Christ is about taking right action in accordance with his commands and his love. Jonah took action. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach this message. Just go this way. Jonah's like, all right, I'll take action. Boom. Right? And what did he have to do to go back? Completely turn around to get to the direction God wanted him to go in the first place. And to say that Jonah learned that lesson a hard way would be an understatement, wouldn't it? How about us? 
How do we choose to learn that lesson in our lives? Guys, it is my hope and prayer that God and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you through this passage today because it was hard for me to digest. It is not easy, nor do I think it should be easy. And God doesn't expect perfection in your life. He expects faithfulness, a seeking after him, a heart that is open to him. Look, I've coached many years different sports. You know how hard it is to coach somebody who already knows everything? I want you to do this. No, I'm good. I got it. I can do it this way. No, you can't. God's saying the same thing to us. Guys, through the power and conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives, may we learn not just to take action, but to take right action that lead to proper perspective and truths of Jesus Christ in our lives that manifest themselves within us to a world that is dying to see it. The world desperately needs the message that is in this book, but they don't just need to hear it and they don't need to have it screamed at them. They need to see it lived out in our lives. Don't think I'm speaking from a point of perfection here. All you got to do is come to one of Luke's Little League baseball games and you will understand very rapidly that I've got a long ways to go. But I'm working. My hope and prayer is that you are as well. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, soften our hearts today. May our hearts be pliable before you. And whatever head knowledge that we have, I pray that you would, would take that head knowledge and work it into heart knowledge. Don't, don't, don't. We don't want to do things just because it's the right thing to do. We don't want to do things just because like, we feel like we have to to make you happy or to make the pastor happy or to make our parents happy. God, we want to do right because we desire to do right. Because it's the best way to live. Because it's how you created us to live and it's because of how your son Jesus sacrificed for us. May that head knowledge become heart knowledge and through your power and your presence and your spirit, may that heart knowledge flesh itself out to those we meet. Not for our glory. God, we want it all to be about you. We want your kingdom come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we pray that to this end right now. And we ask these things in the precious and majestic name of your son, Jesus. Amen.